Welcome to South Point Church Online, wherever you might be watching from today. And if today is your first time, we're fired up that you're here. Hey, my name is Matt, and I'm part of the team. I want to share right from the start why sticking around this morning might be really important. And here it is. Every single one of us it will be facing an unseen and dangerous pitfall. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you live, and it doesn't matter where you're at with Jesus and faith. So let me say that again. All of us, myself included, you are facing an unseen and dangerous pitfall. And here's what I know. This is regardless of who you are. It doesn't matter whether you're a guy or girl, or you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter the color of your skin, the amount of money in your bank account, or your education. Literally every single one of us is facing this. And it doesn't matter where where you live. It doesn't matter whether you live in our local county here in St. Mary's or in our state of Maryland or anywhere in the U.S. This applies to everyone in the world no matter where you're watching from and it applies regardless of your faith. Whether you show up today with no faith and you're kind of exploring this or maybe you grew up in a home that had a different faith or maybe you've been a follower of Jesus since you're a little kid. All of us, every single one of us, is facing an unseen and dangerous pitfall that has the ability to impact every area of our life. That's why today is so important. And here's how we know we're about to face this pitfall, and I'll put it up on the screen, it's this. 2020 was a perfect storm. It was like everything worked together of loss and pain for all of us. Here's my bet. Every single person watching this experienced some kind of loss and some kind of pain in 2020. Between the pandemic, between the social injustice, and between a divisive political election here in the U.S., all of us have experienced loss and pain. I mean, when we went into lockdown and we've gone from lockdown to open to lockdown in this pandemic, we've all experienced loss. I mean, some of us experienced the loss of a job, maybe even the loss of a business. For some, we experienced the loss of a vacation or the loss of a dream of watching our kid uh, walk across the stage and get their degree, whether it's at high school or college. For some, you had a dream of a wedding this past year and it looked drastically different, you experience loss. For some of us, we actually experience real loss. We lost family members and others experience the loss of vacation and the loss of other things and the loss of friendships. I mean, the pandemic in 2020, regardless of where you are in the world and where you are at faith, you experience loss and pain. It's happened to all of us. And then you throw on top of that, right, the social injustice. We've lost trust and we've lost the ability to have decency and empathy and have hard conversations in kinds ways. And don't even get me started on the political di division where we literally lost our minds, right? I know people that have lost friends and relationships over that. And so here's what I know to be true for you, and I know it's true for me, is that 2020 was a perfect storm of loss and pain for all of us. No one escaped that. And here's the pitfall that we are about to face. What if, like, what if culture, what if the church has taught you and has taught me to practice an unhealthy habit that actually damages our mental health? What if culture and church has taught us this habit of ignoring, denying, and avoiding grief because we've bought into a lie? And here's the lie that I believe culture and the church has taught you and I when it comes to grief due to loss and pain. And here it is. You shouldn't grieve because it's wimpy and wasteful. I can't tell you the number of people that I've talked to when they share a story about a pet that was with them for you know a decade or even two decades and it was soul breaking because they were part of the family and people would say things like, well, you should just move on or that's not important. Or when something else happens, the loss of a dream, someone will say, well, you should just woman up or man up or just stop that. Why don't you get on and move over? I mean, how hurtful and it's just wasteful. I mean, there's something about our culture and there's something about the church that tells us and teaches us that when we experience loss, 
that if we are going to grieve it, that is wimpy and it's wasteful. Listen, you can't go back and undo it, so you should just move forward and you should just forget about it and it's just wimpy and wasteful, and that is actually the opposite. Listen, I want to stop for a second. Did you know that science has proven that when we avoid grief, that it is damaging to our mental health. And when we damage our mental health, it can impact areas of our lives that deeply matter to us. It can impact the relationships like our marriage with our kids. It can impact our jobs and with our coworkers. It can impact our physical bodies and can impact our well-being. And you know what this lie looks like that culture tells us? And this is how kind of culture and the church teaches us this lie when it comes to grief, which when we avoid grief, damages our mental health. And here's what culture and church teaches us. Culture says, stay busy, stay full. Culture says, listen, if you experience loss, if you experience pain, go back to work. Entertain yourself. Go work on something. Don't be still. Move. Listen to music. Do something. Stay busy. Entertain yourself so that you don't feel. And if entertaining yourself through busyness or through work or working so that you don't feel, if that doesn't work, then just stay full. Why don't you consume some food? Why don't you consume some alcohol? Why don't you consume some porn? Why don't you just try to pleasure yourself into numbness? Our culture says that when we experience loss and pain, well, we should just stay busy and stay full. Why is it that in America, that we can bury a child or a parent, and the goal is that we go back to work in a couple of days? Why is it that when we experience loss and grief, it's always about what we consume to numb ourselves? And culture isn't the only guilty party. I mean, the church as a whole is equally guilty because the church has told people that belief erases the need for grief. Now I wanna stop here. I can't speak to all of culture, but as a pastor, I can absolutely speak to everyone watching about the church. Belief erases the need for grief is a falsehood. It is totally untrue. It's not in the Bible. You know how I know this? Because in the Bible, God grieves. In the Bible, Jesus grieves. In the Bible, followers of Jesus grieve, and God calls us to grieve. Somewhere along the line, someone bought into a lie in church that somehow because we believe that God is good and God loves us and that while we might experience pain in this life someday Jesus is going to come back and make it all right that erases for the need for grief which is so untrue did you know that God grieves in Genesis 6 6 you and I are told this it says God grieved that he made humankind he created us to be in relationship and we stiffed armed God and said, we don't want any part of you. And then it says, not only did God grieve, but it says this, his heart was filled with pain. God grieved. Well, not only did God the Father grieved, God the Son, Jesus grieved. Matter of fact, while Jesus was here on his earth, one of his good friends, Lazarus, died. And when he saw the pain that it caused, we're told in John eleven thirty five 35, that Jesus was, was hurt on the inside and that he wept. So for some reason, we bought into this myth in our culture and in church that we should stay busy or stay full. And that if we're followers of Jesus, well, that belief erases the need for grief. And those are both lies that science has told us and the Bible tells us is untrue. And then here's the pitfall that the lie and what culture and church has taught us leads to, and I'm gonna put it up on the screen. Avoiding grief is an American pastime with devastating mental health consequences. Avoiding grief has become a pastime in our world where we stay busy, we stay medicated, and we ignore and avoid pain because we religify and do all these other things and avoid grief but it creates devastating mental health consequences. And you know what? I know this to be true before I knew Jesus, and it was true after I began to follow Jesus. And it leaves me asking a question that all of us should be asking today, regardless of who you are, where you live, and where you're at in your faith. And here's the question. How many of us are carrying unacknowledged, unrecognized, and unmourned grief from 2020? into 2021 that might be an unseen pitfall that creates damage in our life in areas that none of us want. 
Now, before I go any further, I wanna bring everyone up to speed. Hey, we're in week two of our series, It's Okay to Need Jesus and a Therapist. And this whole series is based on two truths. Now, last week, we had to debunk four lies that people believe in culture and in church about mental health. If you missed it, you gotta go back and watch that. But I want to today remind us of the two truths that this whole series, It's Okay to Need Jesus and a Therapist, are all about. And here's truth number one that we talked about last week. Using spirituality to ignore how God holistically made us not only is wrong, it's harmful. Listen, God made us spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental beings. When we kind of use spirituality to ignore how God made us, that isn't only honoring spirituality, it actually harms us. And so you might wanna go back and watch that. But out of this, here's the other truth that we admitted, and it's this, it's okay to not be okay. I wanna stop for a second. If every single one of us experienced loss and pain in 2020, then it's okay today to tell your spouse and to tell your friend and to tell yourself and to tell God, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to grieve the losses that you and your family have experienced and to acknowledge that that pain is real because God cares about all of who you are. He cares about you physically. He cares about you spiritually. He cares about you mentally and emotionally. If you're watching today and you missed last week, I really want to encourage you. You can catch up on our website or you can uh, go to our YouTube channel and you can watch on demand there. Now, back to the problem that we started with. It's this unhealthy habit that we, almost all of us practices that damages our mental health. And here's what it is. We buy into the lie. We avoid grief because we think grief is wimpy and it's wasteful. Now here's why. Now listen, I know that sometimes you watch this with kids or listen to music and I I need everyone to listen in because you, you need to hear this. So just stop for a second and listen. Here's why that lie is so devastating. Are you ready? And here's why. Because in the real world, and if you really try to love other people, loss is unavoidable. Let me say that one more time. If you are gonna live in the real world, If you're gonna try to experience genuine love, then all of us, regardless of who you are, where you live and where you're out of faith, you will experience loss and pain. It's unavoidable. The only way to avoid the pain of loss is to close yourself off and wall yourself off and shut people out so that you are not close and you don't care about anyone but you and then you numb and medicate your life through consumption. And here's the question, if no one knows you and you don't love and you don't care for anyone and no one loves you and you numb yourself through life, is that really living? And we know the answer. That's why this lie that grieving is wasteful and wimpy is so devastating. Because if we go through real life and we choose to try to love, real life and real love include loss and pain. It's unavoidable. Which leads us to a truth that God has told us and it leads us to a truth that science tells us. And I'll put this truth up on the screen. It's this. The natural response to loss is grief. I mean, that's what happens. God built in something into the human body, to our emotions, to our mental, to our physical body, to our spiritual body, that when we experience the pain of loss, we have a process that helps us not, you know, kind of move on, but move forward. God gave us the gift of grief. I like how Counseling Today, they wrote an article and they said, there are many kinds of loss. I have a friend who was trying out for this job in the military and they were told they would get it. They were physically fit and it was the special thing that they wanted to do. And in this one test, they were about a minute and a half off from reaching the goal. Matter of fact, he so impressed his commanding officer that he gave him a second chance to do this, but you had to qualify. And he missed the time again. And all of a sudden, he experienced the loss of a dream. He couldn't do that job. There's all kinds of loss. What about the person, the girl, who tries out for a team or for a sport because that's what she wants to do, only to discover that she doesn't have the physical talents to do that? What about the the young kid who dreams of like being something, doing something uh, in kind of an education field, but discovers that's not a strength of theirs? 
What happens when we experience this, this loss of like, we thought our kids would be something and when they get older, they make decisions. And we experience this loss of a dream of who our kids would be. The loss of a marriage that ended in divorce and betrayal. The loss of a job, the loss of promotion. For some of us, it's the loss of health. I mean, Counseling Today said it so well. The natural response to loss, and there are so many kinds of losses that go unacknowledged and unrecognized and unmourned. But grief is the natural response. And when we avoid grief, we damage our mental health. And it leads to the problem that all of us are facing today. I'm gonna to put up on the screen is this. Our habit, because it's a habit, right? Like if you go through life and you try to love people, well then loss and pain is a normal part of life. So our habit of denying grief not only damages our mental health, it causes dysfunction in other areas of our lives. And the reality is, is none of us wanna, this is the pitfall. This is the unseen damaging pitfall that you, that I, that we need to avoid. How do we not deny grief and create dysfunction in other areas of our life? And it leaves us asking this question this morning, and it's this right here. What do we, what do I, what do you, what do we do with grief when we experience the unavoidable pain of loss? Because if you're gonna live in the real world, and if you're gonna try to love people, then loss and pain is unavoidable is the lie of culture of staying busy and staying full, is the lie of the church that belief erases the need for grief, all that we're left with. You know what, in the middle of this emotional and tough topic, there's some really good news. God knew that every single human being who ever existed on the planet Earth would have to deal with this. And matter of fact, what's so amazing is that Jesus himself models what it looks like to process and to grieve, and so do other followers. But God absolutely speaks to this, and I love what God has to say about this in the Bible. We find it in Proverbs, and I just wanna stop for a moment. And if you've experienced loss and you have undealt with grief, I just wanna share these words from the heart of God this morning. It says this, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, did you hear that? He is close. God cares about all of you. God cares not just for your spiritual being, he cares for your emotional well-being and your mental well-being and your physical. God is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Do we have anyone here today who is brokenhearted and who is crushed in spirit? I've got great news. God wants to be close to you because he cares for you. So here's what I wanna to do today. I wanna briefly share four starting, they're just starting, four starting steps to processing grief. Now, it's confession time, and this is really embarrassing as a pastor, but I don't ever wanna to pretend to be somebody that I'm not. I wanna be true. I spent my whole life avoiding grief. I was never taught growing up how to deal with grief, and I surely wasn't taught in the church how to deal with grief. Matter of fact, most of what I'm gonna share with you today, I learned the painful way of going through it and hitting my head against the wall. And in most of these four steps, well, I still have room to go in all of them. And so I just want you to know, as I share today, I'm not sharing as an expert, I'm just sharing as someone who's on a journey just like you. And so here's the first step that you, that I, that we can take so that we don't damage our mental health, so we don't create dysfunction in our life, so that we don't avoid grief, that we process grief. So that not that we move on, but that we can move forward. And here's step number one, is allow yourself time and space to feel. And as soon as I say that, I bet many of you in your heart right now feel fear. Whoa, 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 Pastor Matt. What do you mean allow yourself time and space to feel? Whoa, 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 these feelings things, oh, I don't, I don't want any of those, right? Like, I, I don't want those, right? I mean, busyness and consumption are often the enemies 
of health, right? Like we're just so busy on YouTube, on our Netflix show, on Facebook, in our jobs, shuttling kids, being busy at every moment, every kid involved in something. We just start busy from the morning and we end busy and fall exhausted on sleep. And here's the question, we have created a lifestyle and a habit where busyness and consumption are often enemies of our well-being and our health. We don't ever create space to allow ourselves time and space to feel. You know what I need to be true? Is, is that if you fear silence, that if I fear stillness, that if we fear being alone without music or people where we can be still and silent, it is usually an indicator that we are trying to avoid some feelings on the inside that we don't want to feel. We need to allow yourself some time and space to feel. Now, I told you that like I'm not good at any of these things. The matter of fact, most of my life, I've tried to avoid any of the pain and grief that I felt. And to be honest with you, I've experienced a certain amount of grief, you know, compared to some people, it's not a lot, and to others, it seems like a lot. It was kind of funny and appropriate as I was preparing this message, I was trying to figure of a time where I actually allowed myself some time and space to feel, and I couldn't think of any. Matter of fact, it was just over a year and a half ago that my grandmother, uh, the last person in my life that knew me um, from when I was a little kid, from a little baby, right? Um, she passed away. And unfortunately, uh, my grandpa isn't a really religious person. He didn't want to have a funeral. He wanted her cremated. Then COVID happened. And, and so we, didn't, we never had a funeral. We never had a celebration. Uh, we need, did nothing to celebrate and grieve her life. And as I was thinking about this, I started to weep, like I was in my office, like I mean, no, I'm telling you the truth, like I was just literally weeping and sobbing, it's not, you know, like I was just weeping. And you know what I said to myself? The things that culture and the church has taught me, I said, Matt, you have a sermon to prepare, Matt, you have work to do, stop it, man up, stop how you feel. And I'm saying this all as I'm trying to go, hey, I need to allow yourself some time and space. So I got up and I gave myself some time and space to feel. And this is the first step because all of us are gonna experience loss and pain if you live in the real world and you try to have real love with people. If you allow busyness and consumption to be the enemy of your health, you will create damage in your mental health and will always show up and impact you in other areas of life that you don't want. So the first step is allow yourself time and space to feel. And here's what I love. Did you know that Jesus did this? Jesus allowed himself some time and space to feel. You see, belief didn't stop Jesus from grieving and publicly grieving. Matter of fact, we see one of the most public displays of grief by Jesus. When he was on the cross, we're gonna pick it up and put it on the screen, Mark 15, it says this. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice and then it gives the Greek word and then it says this. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Jesus, God the Son, felt abandoned and he cried that grief out. You see, for the only time in eternity on the cross, when Jesus was taking the penalty for my sin and my brokenness and your sin and your brokenness and all the sin and brokenness of the world, for the only time in eternity, Jesus was separated from God the Father and God the Spirit. He was alone and suffering and Jesus wasn't silent. Jesus didn't stuff. Jesus didn't pretend. Jesus cries out for all to hear exactly how he feels. God why have you abandoned me? And if you've ever prayed that, it's okay. Jesus said the same thing. Jesus created time and space, even on the cross, to honor his feelings and his grief. And so the first step to not allowing the denying and avoiding of grief is to create time and space. So I want to stop for a quick second and you gotta go, whoa, that's really scary. And so here's what I wanna do. I wanna encourage you very practically. You know what you can do? Plan an hour. Not with your wife, not with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, not with your earbuds, not with your cell phone, not with your laptop. Take a pen and paper or like a, a notebook or like a journal and go somewhere alone with no distractions. You're not gonna listen to music, you're not gonna watch anything. And sit down and maybe at the top of the paper write 2020 and 2021 and go, where have I avoided grief? And stop and create space and time to feel. 
And maybe moving forward, our lives shouldn't be so busy with consumption and busyness that we never have time to feel. Which leads me into step number two of the starting of the grieving process. Share with another you trust. Listen, I get it, we all get it, right? Like when something happens, like uh, like year and a half ago, almost two years ago, uh, my cat, Fluffy, I loved Fluffy. When I was sick, he would sit at my feet and purr, and he became my cat, he loved me, he was adorable. And when he passed away, I cried like a baby, but I came back to work that day, I came to work the next day, and I just kept, I did all the things I wasn't supposed to do. But you know what, when we grieve, we're supposed to share with another. And oftentimes, if we're really honest, we don't wanna share with people the pain because we often believe it's pity, but here's the truth. It's not pity, it's vulnerability to allow another to see you. I'll never forget this true story. I have this good friend, uh, he's moved away out of the area, and unfortunately, we don't keep in touch, not because of my choice, but uh, because of his choice. And, and to be honest, that makes me a little bit sad, but like, but we were having breakfast one morning and we were talking about life. We were both kind of in a very similar life situation, right? And I shared something that I was really struggling with, that was really hard, and just kind of this painful thing that I was going through. And at the end, he looked at me in the eye and he said, thanks so much for sharing which is the first time anyone thanked me for sharing a painful story with him. And I was really confused. And so I said, what do you mean, thank you? And he says, Matt, you know, you are always so guarded. You always give this picture of this person that you want everyone to assume that you are. I think it was really cool that you would let me in and know a little bit about who you really are. I'll never forget that moment. It was a true gift from my friend to let me know that when you share pain, it's not about getting pity, it's really being vulnerable and allowing another to see you when you're hurting and to go, I am not gonna pretend to be something that I'm not. I'm gonna allow you to see me as I truly am. And listen, share with another you trust. Now, the reason I said trust is because the truth is in a busted world with flawed people, you shouldn't always share all of your pain with people who you can't necessarily trust with it. So you need to find someone that you trust to share your pain with. For you, it might be a spouse. And I wanna stop for a second, I wanna talk to guys for a second. Listen, I know that there are generalities and stereotypes for, for reasons, and, and I believe, you know, that they're just that, they're generalities, that they're guys and girls who all feel different. But for some reason, most men believe that they can't share their pain with their wives because they don't want to burden them. But what we're doing is we are, we are um, creating a division. We are, we're not being intimate. We're not being honest with who we are. And at some point, they'll know and see that we're hurting. But if we don't ever communicate that, then they know we're withholding a piece of of ourselves from them. And the same goes for ladies with other ladies and guys with their guy friends. Like at some point, we should share with one another who you trust. It's not pity. It really is just being vulnerable. And here's what's amazing. You might go, Matt, where did you get this from? Well, this is exactly what Jesus did. You see, Jesus taught us how to grieve. You might go, hey, where did Matt, Jesus share with another? Well, we see this in Mark. He says he took Peter, James, and John. So listen, Jesus grabbed some close friends along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Jesus was grieving. Jesus was in pain and he was real with his friends. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. If you've ever felt overwhelmed with sorrow, you are in great company. Jesus was overwhelmed with sorrow. He said to, what's the word? Maybe you want to type that in the chat, them. Jesus shared with Peter, James, and John, his posse, his little crew. He shared with them personally what was going on in the inside. He knew the suffering. He knew the betrayal. He knew the abandonment. He knew the despair that he would feel being disconnected from God the Father and God the Spirit for the only time in eternity. And he didn't want to just keep that on the side. He shared that with his friends. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. I wonder today, how many of us have genuine friendships where we keep watch with each other? Because if we go through real life and we really try to love, well then loss and pain, it's an unavoidable thing. Do we have any people in our lives, any friends, where we can truly share and say, this isn't about pity, I just want you to see who I truly am and where I'm truly at. So number one, make space and time to feel. Number two, is to share with another that you trust. Here's number three, and it'll be the hardest. Getting help is not weakness, it's wisdom. 
You see, there's a lie that has been passed around in culture and church, and it goes like this. Time and wishful thinking cause healing, and nothing can be further the truth. Time and wishful thinking don't cause healing. All wounds don't heal with time. You know what causes healing? The process of getting healed causes healing. Trying to forget about it, trying to like consume your way out of it, that doesn't work. Time and in kind of ignoring and pretending don't actually cause healing. Actually going through the healing process does. So getting help isn't weakness, it's wisdom. You see, at some point in our life, all of us will experience a loss so painful that we will need help. Let me say that again. All of us, I don't care if you're a guy or girl, I don't care if you have no faith or you've been a follower of Jesus since you're a little kid, I don't care whether you live in America or a different country, all of us are gonna experience a loss that is so painful that at some point we will need help and that's not weakness, that is wisdom. Listen, if you and I get stuck in a place where it just harms ourself and harms other and we don't get help, that is not strength, that is stupidity. Let me stop and say that one more time, right? Like if you and I are stuck in a place that hurts ourselves and hurts others, right? To stay there isn't strength. That's just harmful. That's just dysfunctional. At some point, we'll experience loss or pain in such a way that we are going to need help. You know me and my love for true examples and true stories. I have a friend uh, here locally in the community. Uh, years ago, uh, there was a hurricane uh, that came through our local county. It was a pretty powerful hurricane. And matter of fact, this friend of mine, he lived in this place where not only did the hurricane come through, but they believe uh, that there had been like a little mini tornado or like a wind impact because it literally looked like when you went to his house, um, there were trees all around, that a bomb went off and blew, I mean, trees were literally just blown over. I mean, it was one of the most amazing things. I mean, it hit his house, it was all over. I mean, it's just one guy, had a, you know, he had four, four kids and it was just him and his wife. There was no way in the midst of that damage that he would be able to solve that problem all by himself. So you know what happened is, is all of his friends came and they what? They helped him because the damage and the destruction and the trauma was so big that he couldn't do it by himself. And I want to ask you a question on the other side of this camera today. Have you experienced a loss or pain? that actually needs some help because it was so powerful that you really just can't walk through it by yourself. And you shouldn't. And you know, here's what's amazing again. Do you know that Jesus actually got help? And you might go, when did Jesus ever get help? Because it means like he's Jesus, right? Like, I mean, when, when did he ever get help? Well, we see this in the eyewitness account of the gospel we're gonna actually put up on the screen. It says, when Jesus saw his mother standing there, now I need to stop. Jesus is up on the cross. He's about to die. And then he's going to conquer hell and death and he's going to go back to heaven, but he's going to leave his mom here on earth. So Jesus does something pretty amazing. Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved. We believe that's John. And then he said to her, dear woman, here's your son. And then he said to his disciple, here's your mother. You see, in ancient times, if you had family members and you were going to pass away, oftentimes the mother or, or the wife, you would ask a relative to care for because you had provided for. So here Jesus is asking for help. He's asking the disciple to care for his mom. He's going, listen, I'm about to die. I'm about to conquer hell and death. I'm about to go back to my heavenly father, but I need your help. Would you take care of my mom here on earth? Would you do that for me? He asked for help. And at the end of this message, South Point has some practical ways that we want to provide practical help for anyone who needs it. And so I hope that you stick to the end. And I'm coming to the last step. And again, these are just starting steps to grieving, but, but here's the last one, and it's one of the most important ones I'm going to put on the screen. Endure instead of trying to escape. Now I want to stop here for a second and just be brutally honest and transparent. I spent most of my life trying to escape the pain that comes with grief. Before I knew Christ, my escaping came through drugs, alcohol, sex, harmful ways. Like, I just, I tried to ruin my life. Um, in recovery, we used to call it suicide um, in the installment plan. And then when I became a follower of Jesus, I realized that hurting others and hurting myself in those kinds of ways weren't good. But then I just decided I would be busy and, and just kind of hurt myself a little bit later by denying that pain. And so trying to escape isn't really good. At some point, we're just going to need to endure instead of trying to escape. And here's why this is so important. 
Facing pain hurts. Like, I'm not gonna lie to anyone here. If you take time to make space and time to feel, it feels bad, it hurts. When you have lost, it hurts. And it's always proportionate to how good or how much you love that thing or how big that dream was or how much that mattered to you. It's always proportional. So the greater the loss, the greater the hurt. I'm sorry, facing pain hurts. I wish I could lie to you and tell you that because you love Jesus or because you watch this message, that somehow as you grieve, you get to avoid pain. It's not true. Facing pain hurts. But the dysfunction of avoidance hurts more. Did you catch that? You and I can ignore and avoid the pain of grief, but all we're doing is creating more pain later because we're gonna experience dysfunction in areas of life that we didn't want. So we have two choices. We can pay the price now, which will be way less than the dysfunction and the pain later. At some time, we have to endure instead of trying to escape. You know, I know I don't look it, uh, but before the pandemic, uh, my hobby was to powerlift. And powerlifting is a weightlifting sport. It's where you squat, you bench, and you're deadlift. And what I would tell people that, you know, that was kind of my hobby, that I would squat, bench, and deadlift, and I would tell them the weights that I could do, they were like, whoa, 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 you better be careful. Don't you know that you're gonna hurt your back by deadlifting? Don't you know that you're gonna hurt your back by squatting? And then I would have to, I'd kind of laugh and go, hey, did you know that before I started deadlifting, benching, and squatting, you know, I sit a lot for my job. I'm a pastor, I come in early, I pray, I read, so I'm sitting, you know? And then I lead and have meetings with staff. I'm sitting, and then I meet with people, and I'm sitting, and then I answer emails, and I'm sitting, and then I go home, and I sit. And so like, listen, I used to have back pain because I didn't really exercise a lot. And I would always tell them that like, my exercising of deadlifting, benching, and squatting actually strengthened my back, and I felt less back pain while I was exercising than I did when I wasn't. Here it comes. When you exercise, it's uncomfortable. Exercising doesn't always feel good. And sometimes when you exercise hard, you're sore the next day. But here's what I know. The uncomfortableness of exercising saved me the pain of dysfunction. And that is God's gift of grief to you, to me, and the world. Grief is the exercise that is uncomfortable, that saves us from the dysfunction of stuffing and ignoring the pain of loss. Because at some point, we're gonna experience the pain. It's either the pain of grieving or the pain of dysfunction. And I can promise you, you'll never wanna experience the pain of dysfunction. So at some point, we just have to endure. Loving means you're gonna experience hurt. Living in the real world means you're gonna experience loss. It's just a part of life. But there's a reason why we should endure. There's some really good news. You see, the follower of Jesus, his name was Paul. You see, Paul used to actually persecute Christians until he encountered a risen Jesus. People always talk about, well, I don't know if I believe the Gospels, but you know what? Paul, it is history has proven that Paul used to persecute Christians and then had a resurrecting encounter with the risen Jesus. He became a Christ follower. He planted churches. And here's what he wrote some people. And Paul models all the things that we talk about. We're gonna pick it up in 2 Corinthians. We were under great pressure. So Paul's writing a letter to his friend, and he obviously created time and space to write this letter, and is in letting them know how hard things are. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. He's going, listen, man, this thing about killed us. So that we despaired life itself. He's like, hey, man, life was so hard. Like, the real life and loving people, man, it, it was hard. So much that we despaired life. Indeed, we felt like we had received the sentence of death. Sometimes when you love people, sometimes as you go through real life, it is busted, it is broken, and it just causes despair. But what I love about this is he shares, he isn't finished. He goes on and he says this. He says, but this happened, but that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. You know, in a couple weeks, we're gonna celebrate Easter. And here's the greatest news. All that Jesus did while as nice and as good as it would have been, wouldn't have helped you or I or bit if Jesus was still in the tomb. And what we celebrate on Easter is that the tomb is empty. 
that Jesus said what was going to happen, and then he conquered hell and death. And on him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. You see, the reason that you, the reason that I, the reason that Paul, and the reason that Jesus endured is because we have a hope in a God who has the power to do what we cannot do. And there's where we find this tension that is so hard to say in church in the world, is that in the real world and with real love, you'll experience legitimate and real pain. The kind of pain that you can't move on from. I had these good friends. They lost a child. I've had good friends who've miscarried. I've had good friends who've experienced horrible atrocities. I've experienced friends who've had health issues. In this world, Jesus tells us you will have trouble. In this world, we can grieve and admit that there is pain and brokenness. That pain and grief are a part of our story. So we don't move on, but we can move forward. Do you want to know why? Because it's not the whole story. You see, there's a day where God is going to come back and he's going to fix all that is wrong and he's going to make all the things that are busted right. We can have hope, not in some false thing, but in a risen Jesus who conquered hell and death. If I was going to sum it all up, you know that we should make time and space to feel, that we should share with another that we trust, that we should get help when we need it, that we should endure instead of escape. I would I'd sum it all up in this statement right here, and it's this. God-given hope because the tomb is empty, because God loves us, and because God is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. God-given hope allows us to embrace the grieving process. While it's painful in the moment, it saves us from the pain of dysfunction later. The God-given hope allows us to embrace the grieving process instead of avoiding it. As I close, I told you the truth. I've experienced some pain. You know, I was nine years old when my mother completed suicide. I was probably 10 or 11 when I was sent to a counselor who was a child molester. I was 12 and a half when my dad took me to the police station and said, I hope you got what you wanted. I wasn't even 16 when my dad says, we disowned you. My wife and I have experienced a miscarriage. We've had immediate family suffer, some really, uh, some, you know, hurtful uh, health issues. Like, uh, I've experienced loss, like, I, I get it, like, loss is painful. And I've spent most of my life avoiding grief. And here's what I did before I knew Jesus. I just medicated my life. I just decided, you know what, I was gonna party like there was no tomorrow. And I was just gonna close myself up. I wasn't gonna care about the world or anybody else. And I was living my life just for pleasure. Basically just a dead man walking. And I can tell you from experience, that isn't life. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and life to the full. But then when I became a Christ follower, I went to church. And it was a good church. But it was a church that kind of just kind of lifted up spirituality and ignored all the rest of us. And no one ever really taught me how to grieve when you experience loss. So instead of staying busy I just, and consuming, I, just, I chose busyness. I just chose work. I just chose that I'm just gonna work through all this pain. And I can tell you that it created dysfunction in my physical body, it created dysfunction in my relationships. And to be honest with you, I'm still figuring out how to process grief. But I know this, avoiding grief only damages our mental health and it only creates dysfunction in other areas of our lives that we want to be well. And so at South Point, those words of God, that he's close to the brokenhearted, that he saves the crushed in spirit, the words of Jesus that I came that you might have life and life to the full, mean that we need to address grief because no one, regardless of who you are or where you live or where you're at in faithfulness or faith, will miss out on loss if you live in the real world and try to experience real love. At South Point, we don't want to just give you steps. We want to provide resources. I'm going to put this up on the screen. Hey, if you're watching today and you're overwhelmed with grief, I apologize. I'm not a professional counselor. There are no professional counselors on staff. 
Uh, there's a hotline number that if you need to call or text, if you feel overwhelmed with grief and sorrow and, and just aren't able to make it through today, like there, there's some immediate help that, that you can access. If you're here today and you're going, man, like, how do I take steps with grief? Maybe you're going, hey, I need some help. I realize the loss was big and that I need help. And South Point has a budget that we've set aside to help people get counseling. And so we have a process which you can meet with a pastoral staff person. And so you can go to southpointforyou.com backslash time to talk. And you can sign up for an appointment with a, one of our pastoral staff. And then we might be able to connect you to resources like professional counseling or like our Stevens ministry who are Stevens ministers who aren't professional counselors, but they are people who can walk alongside you in difficult seasons or celebrate recovery or small groups. We really want to help you connect them. So there's the website right there. You can go there. You can sign up for a slot. And listen, if you've been watching this, uh, please, we have several weeks uh, coming up later. We're going to talk about things, but we are going to have one of these weeks of the series. We're going to have some professional counselors. Where we're going to ask submitted questions and the counselors will ask answer those um, on the message. So if you have any questions, please submit them to church at southpointforyou.com. Hey, you are going to not want to miss next Sunday. You're not going to miss it because we're going to tackle the number one enemy of mental health. So you're not going to miss it. Hey, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much, God. God, that you showed us how to grieve and that just because we believe doesn't mean we can't grieve. Thank you that Jesus showed us what it's like to grieve. And God, that even in your heart, it was filled with pain. God, that you are willing to step into the real world for real love and that if we step into the real world and real love, that that loss and pain are unavoidable and you've given us the gift of grief. God, I pray for whoever needs help that they'd be willing to take steps to get help because Jesus, you came that we might have life and life to the full. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. And never forget, you matter deeply to God.